been down for too long. What are you supposed to do when everybody wants you gone? You gotta draw the line somewhere. You stop right now. They're gonna kill us. Notre santé est en danger, nos enfants sont en danger. Certains le savent et nous mentent. C'est en train de prendre de l'ampleur, hein, j'aime pas ça. Fighting segregation in the American South, a modern day David and Goliath face off, and Romy Schneider's sizzling screen presence. That's all coming up in today's film show. To take us through it, I'm joined by critic Lisa Nesselson. Hi, Lisa. Now we're starting Morning. with Son of the South, a film set in Alabama in 1961. That's based on the memoir of civil rights activist Bob Zellner, a white southerner who quite improbably came from a family with connections to the Ku Klux Klan, but he worked for desegregation and social justice. Now, this film has had a bit more press here in France than it has in the US. Lisa, tell us more. Well, when we say working for social justice, we mean coming this close to getting lynched, as in noose around his neck, which is how this very well-made film begins. A lot of white Southerners really objected to the idea of black citizens being allowed to do basic things such as vote. I heard a French colleague on the radio dismiss this film as the civil rights movement for dummies. But I was impressed by the way it shows the awakening of the conscience of the smart young man who has everything to lose becoming a so-called race traitor and making a total commitment. Now, if you want to see how far we've come, Bob and four of his senior classmates at their all-white college are threatened with expulsion for attending a church service honoring the fifth anniversary of the Montgomery uh, bus boycott. All that the polite young men did was sit in a pew and listen to Reverend Ralph Abernathy uh, mar marvelously played by uh, Cedric the Entertainer, and speak with Rosa Parks in order to write a class paper on race uh, and race relations. Simply listening to what a black person has to say is sufficient grounds for having a cross burned under your window. Now that seems almost comical, but it was no laughing matter. Rednecks also assumed that any white person stupid enough to be in favor of equal rights for blacks must be a commie. The film is viscerally vivid about just how entrenched Jim Crow restrictions were and how violent and determined the Klan was as they and their sympathizers operated with impunity. Okay, well, let's take a look at the pitfalls of standing up for what's right in the Deep South in the early 1960s. I was in a riot and I walked right through it, unharmed. What is the point you're trying to make? Maybe I could go around college campuses talking to students about the Negro cause. What the hell do you think you're doing? Son, I'm starting to wonder if you are aware of the poison in the apple that you have bitten into. You know this movement is about more than just voting rights. We're trying to change the world. You want to jeopardize your whole life for some grand principle? Isn't that what they're doing? So, Lisa, there is always the danger with a film like this that the narrative could be a bit too didactic. How did you find it? Uh, honestly, I didn't find it too didactic. I learned a few things. What Rosa Parks confides about the day she refused to give up her seat on the bus to a white passenger is very interesting in retrospect. We're showing how budding activists are put through a sort of boot camp to undergo verbal and physical humiliation, the better to remain non-violent no matter how horribly they're treated. I found the riot scenes convincing, as in I was kind of cringing in my seat in the theater. The period details are very good, and there is an edginess and a sense of genuine risk everywhere the camera turns. OK, well, another film currently on French screens is a David and Goliath-style drama, which is about the victims of a deadly pesticide who take on the powerful French corporation who makes that pesticide. Fittingly, it is called Goliath. What did you think of this one? I was impressed by this. It's silly to say that filmmakers elsewhere shouldn't even bother tackling this kind of story when Hollywood does it so well with Aaron Brockovich or Dark Waters. It will remain absolutely worthwhile as an undertaking, so long as there are lobbyists continuing to convince politicians that deadly chemicals aren't that deadly, and that if lots of children in French farming communities are born without arms, that's no reason to use the fingers on the end of your intact arm to point at these supposedly evil corporations and these supposedly deadly chemicals. I especially like the way we keep hearing the same catchphrase uttered with great conviction by different people susceptible to lying for a living or 
here for a fee that the pesticide in question has never been linked to any detrimental effects. And in fact, the candy that we give our children is more dangerous and we don't ban that. Wow, OK, well, let's take a look at the battle between an independent lawyer for victims' rights groups and a seemingly unbeatable adversary in Goliath. Ça fait 3-4 ans que leurs lobbies font tout ce qu'ils peuvent pour détruire tous les programmes de santé publique de l'OMS. La tétrazine est le désherbant le plus sûr jamais produit. Le meilleur. Merci. Tout le monde le sait et personne ne dit rien. Et nous, on crève On crève, putain Cultiver sans pesticides se traduirait par la disparition de plus de 30% des volumes produits. Il faut que vous vous battiez. Alors je vous pose la question. Est-ce que les bourreaux gagnent toujours face à leurs victimes now, the character of the lobbyist is one of the most interesting things here, played by the always riveting Pierre Ninet. He's a father-to-be, a loving spouse, and a very bright young man with no qualms about helping to protect the continued approval on the European level of a deadly pesticide that has pretty obviously deprived other people of their spouses or sickened their children. Wow, that is chilling. Now, next to an actress who's being celebrated at the Cinémathèque Française here in Paris, Romy Schneider. Now, the Austrian-born artist was a household name in German-speaking countries as a teenager, and then she came to France as a relative unknown. On the 40th anniversary of her death, this exhibition takes a look at the career of this liberated woman, I suppose, who made some daring personal choices. Oh, this is an excellent show. I spent almost three hours watching the film clips and uh, enjoying the various artifacts. She couldn't speak French when she arrived, yet became the first person to win the Best Actress Award at the Césars in 1975 and a second César three years later. Incredibly, Schneider came to represent a certain kind of French womanhood. Her daughter, Sarah uh, Biasini, wrote a lovely memoir about her mother just a few years ago. Well, indeed, Sarah Biasini did visit that show where our reporters caught up with her. James Fazina has this report. It's an emotional visit for Sarah Biasini as she walks past the pictures and notes on display. She was only five years old when her mother, Romy Schneider, passed away. I'm very moved to see all this, and um, and she's magnificent. Romy Schneider's role as an Austrian empress in the film series Sissy came to define her career, although much to her dismay. She spent her whole life trying to run away from this doll-like character, even though Sissi is actually more cheeky than she appears to be. Just like Romy Schneider herself, really, who spent all her life trying to break away from the image people had of her. She left Germany to join fellow actor Alain Delon in France, although their relationship ended just a few years later, Delon has kept one of her theatre costumes she used when she arrived, which is now on display. <laughs> Schneider went on to work for many successful directors like Lucchino Visconti, Orson Welles, Claude Sauté, and often left small notes for them. Costa Gavras, who directed one of her final films and now heads the archiving organisation that's hosting the exhibition, remembers this well. She had a very intimate relationship with film directors. She liked to write letters, probably because she thought reading words was much stronger than hearing them. More than just a look back at her career, the exhibition takes a deep plunge into Romy Schneider's life, a life that ended tragically with her early death from a cardiac arrest in 1982. So, Lisa, what would you say made Romy Schneider so special? Ah, well, she was almost un terribly photogenic and very conscious of the power that projected. She was nude in a great many of her films, and we can argue all day about the male gaze and how it supposedly warps our regard for real women. But the show makes a case for Schneider very deliberately wanting to represent a woman with a normal body, 
acting natural. Her Hollywood films included What's New Pussycat? We all know the uh, Tom Jones theme song with screenwriter Woody Allen and Peter O'Toole. So in one scene, O'Toole comes home, finds Romy Schnauder, showering, steps in with her fully clothed and they start kissing. She says, should I get dressed or are we going to do the European movie thing? Now, young people today might not understand why that's hilarious, but European movie thing is forthright shorthand for mutually eager sex during the day with the lights on, something that American movies were not known for. Okay, well, we're ending with an unusual documentary. This is in black and white, hardly any dialogue at all, none. It's been 15 years in the making, and it comes from an Armenian director, Artavaj Pelesian, and it's called Nature. Well, Leos Karax, who's Annette, won five Césars, including Best for Director for him, has said that this film, Nature, should be shown to every child on Earth. Now, that's a good-sized audience, but one that may be diminished by uh, natural catastrophes brought on by human neglect for the environment and nature's absolute indifference to human life. The director was born in 1938 in what was then the Soviet Union, and the Cartier Foundation for Contemporary Art here in Paris provides provided much of the funding for him to assemble footage of majestic mountaintops and terrifying tidal waves, earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions. Swept up in the imagery and the music, I kept wondering, where is the camera? How did that footage survive this disaster? This is an incredibly immersive experience that settles the question, is there such a thing as cinematic language with a resounding yes? Okay, well, Lisa, thank you very much for that roundup this week. And thank you at home for watching. We'll leave you with a glimpse of the powerful imagery in nature. Do remember to check out our website for more movie news and we're on social media too. There's more news coming up on France 24 just after this.